Praise the Lord. It's what it's all about, friends. It's all about salvation. You know, we make it to be all about mental illness and about all this other stuff, but without salvation, we got nothing. You ever hear somebody pray and you just want to back them up and say, come on, wait a minute, come on. <laughs> Tony was praying and I just wanted to, just come on. I always wanted to preach in the black church. Because they respond to you. When you're preaching, they're always going, uh-huh. Oh, come on. And it's like, okay, okay. <laughs> right, Ice? Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> come on. Oh, I love you guys. I love you guys. You know, I'm so proud of, of the one that's bringing the message this morning. So proud of him. He's, uh, he's kind of been a son to me for, for a long time. He was what the Lord sent when there wasn't a lot of wind in the sail. And uh, I, I want John Padula to come up and present to you the oracles of God that God would speak through him. And I pray that he would make himself vulnerable at all times in this body. This body is real. What you see is what you get. Amen. We love people. We love God. And we're always going to be going somewhere to do God's bidding. Amen? Amen. John Padula. I love you, man. I love you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. When somebody tells you you look good, does that mean because I usually don't? Is that... Don't know if that's a compliment or not. I will tell you, this church is full of compliments. I was sitting with Patty Brashad and uh, Kelly Barton earlier, and uh, Kelly Barton goes, are you preaching today? And bless Patty, she goes, yeah, God even spoke to a donkey, so I was like, what does that even mean? That was a compliment, but I, I don't know. So, I <laughs> love you. Amen. Well, let's pray and then we'll, uh, we'll get going. Father, we just thank you for your sovereignty. Thank you, God, for your great love for this body and for us. And the fact that while we were yet sinners, you sent your, your only son to die for our sin. Thank you, Jesus, that you saved a wretch like us. There's not one that deserves us and not one that could pay it back. Thank you for that grace. God, I pray that you would move freely in this service today, that your word would wash us thoroughly, that you would change our lives in the name of Jesus. And when we leave here, we wouldn't just be challenged and do some examining, but we would be absolutely radically changed for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. So last week we, uh, we had got a phone call that uh, one of the gentlemen... Gordon Hill, who had went through the program a couple years ago, and uh, he had just recently come back, was at the pre-ranch for a while. We got uh, word that uh, he had passed away, and I had called his, his dad, Dana, that morning and just wanted to confirm that, that that's what happened. And uh, in the midst of his grief and sorrow and just hearing that immediate news, his first words to me were, I cannot do nothing about my son. He said, but Gordon has a twin. Whew. He's got a, a twin named Marcus. And he said, we need to, we need to save Marcus. Because Marcus needs Jesus right now. And that was Gordon. You want to put that up there for a minute? And uh, two days ago, Marcus introduced himself. He's in pre-ranch. He's going to be going through Good Samaritan. <laughs> We had sent that out and people said, man, God sure answers prayers because there's been a lot of people, not just since this has happened, but uh, Gordon had a lot of people praying for Marcus since 2018 and God is touching your family 
And as sorry as we are for the loss, we know that God has a beautiful plan through this, and he's going to bring so much beauty from these ashes. So I love you guys very much. And Marcus, I'm excited to, to watch what God does. Amen. Can we get that other picture up there? Any of you guys see this picture this last week? <laughs> Pastor Tim was sworn in down in Boise. He is the um, District 2 representative in the state of Idaho, 2B, I believe. Where'd he go? Where are you? Oh. 2B uh, down in Boise, so he'll be back and forth for the next three months. Uh, I was reading one of the, um, I think it was Coeur d'Alene Press, but their, their post about it, and then, you know, people can leave comments. And I will tell you, there's some stupid people out there. I will tell you, there are some people that are just absolutely stupid. There was a gentleman that he put on there, he goes, the forefathers would be rolling over in their grave. Apparently these guys don't know anything about separation between church and state. I just wanted, this guy is a moron. <laughs> so forgive me. Let me step away from the pulpit before I say that, but this guy is a moron. And it was really cool because some of you in this body responded to that, and uh, I, I just love you guys. Uh, there's a lot of people who are ignorant. They just don't know, and that's why they make comments like that. Uh, there never was separation between church and state. There was a, a comment that was made, and that was only to protect the church from the state, not vice versa. Amen? So it's just people in their ignorance. They don't know better. But what I would tell you guys, you're going to hear a lot of people make comments, a lot of the younger generations, they want to withdraw from the public square and they want to get out of the marketplace and they don't want to be around any politics. And I will tell you that that is not the direction that we need to go. We have already tried that and it hasn't worked. That's why we're in the mess that we're in today, amen? I would tell you as much as we don't want to be in politics or in those types of things, there are men and women of God who need to be appointed in those positions to make a difference. Amen? And I would tell you whether it's in business, <clears throat> whether it's in business, politics, the marketplace, wherever you can be, whenever you can be there, make a godly difference for the people around you. Amen? Uh, I think that we're the ones who need to be in those places so the enemy's agenda stops making and taking ground in our community. Amen? Because if we love our kids and the ones who are coming up after us, we should be uh, putting in place things that will protect them, not things that will harm them. And since we've backed up for so long, the enemy has taken so much ground, there's all these rules, laws, ordinances, all of this stuff that absolutely brings damage and death and destruction into our hometown, and we need to do something different. Praise the Lord. So, Tim Remington for president, and then... Uh... <laughs> yes, we could have church at the Capitol. Amen. I want to go through a few verses today, actually quite a few verses. Uh, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that people uh, misunderstand, misinterpret. Uh, sometimes people even abuse some of these verses. And so I want to walk all of us through some of those verses today. So if you turn to 1 Corinthians 11 with me. We're going to start in verse 2. If you have not signed up for the Valentine's dinner banquet, I believe it's the 15th, right? Marianne, do you want to give the announcement? Are you raising your hand back there? I'll be there after the service. If anyone wants to sign up, that's okay. Okay. So that table right there outside of the double doors, Marianne will be there to sign up anybody who needs signed up for the Valentine's Day banquet. Uh, it is not for couples only. Uh, a lot of people have been asking those questions. Do I have to bring a date? No, you can come with, with just you and Jesus. Amen? The best date ever. So, I know some men think it's awkward to be the bride of Christ. Right? Any men feel like that? Some manly men in here say, well, I don't want to be the bride. You know, you can come as the bride. Amen? How many of you guys have ever heard uh, people talk about the fact that, that God is the head over Christ and Christ is the head over man and man is the head over woman? How many of you guys have heard that, uh, whether it's from a pulpit or just in your, your everyday um, outings? You guys heard that before, some of you guys? 
<laughs> you know what's funny? Earlier when pastor was playing this little light of mine and he said, how many of you guys are from down south? Everybody from prison raised their hand. <laughs> Not South Boise, right? Not Southern Idaho. He meant down south. So it was like 99% of our congregation raised their hand. I was like, you guys aren't from down south. <laughs> then it clicked. All of the people from the prison raised their hands. So. <laughs> We've heard this mentioned multiple times and there are people who take, take advantage of it. And I will tell you this, that, that there needs to be a headship in our lives. Amen? There needs to be a head over us as we're called to be a head over others. It's, account, it's accountability, it's being responsible, um, and I will tell you, if you have yet to yield yourself to God and subject yourself underneath Jesus Christ, then you have no business being the head over anything else. Amen? Until you reach that point, and you say, you know what, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, and it starts with me, you have no business being the head over anything else. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Starting in verse 2, it says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them unto you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. I will tell you, women, that's your way out right there. Right? All you have to do is listen to the man. Listen to your pastor. Listen to your leadership. Listen to your husband. And then you're not accountable to God, right? So when, when God brings judgment on your house, it's going to start with the man. All you're responsible for is making sure that you yield underneath his leadership. And then if he makes bad decisions, you're covered, right? That's basically God giving you an out. So you, you're ducking right there while the two by four hits us right in the head. So be thankful for that, right? Sometimes women like to say, I don't want to subject myself under him. I'm not going to yield and submit. That's your way out. So I'll take advantage of it while you can. When it's time, us men are the ones who are going to have to stand before God. You women will stand before God for as uh, how you yielded and subjected yourself under the, the leadership that God put in your life, whether it's your husband or your church leadership. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth, with her head uncovereth, uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is what? The woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Talking about creation. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman was created for the man. Isn't that beautiful? You know, sometimes in our culture and in the way that we think and the way that we're taught, uh, we like to buck up against those things. But if we would just take a biblical stance, a biblical world view on creation between man and woman, it would be absolutely amazing. Amen? We have a hard time with that. I want to turn over to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians 11, when we're talking about the head, the Greek word is kephale, which means literally the head of or the one who has rule over. And the one who has rule over is absolutely not a control thing. It's just the one that is an authority over. Amen? The one that is an authority over. So it's a blessing on both pieces. In Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You'll hear every wedding that we do around here, we talk about Ephesians 5 because we believe it's important not just for the ones getting married, but that the ones who are here as witnesses, that everybody knows that they were taught and they understand their role in the marriage, just for the accountability. 
For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. You know, not to get too far off track, but oftentimes when we're doing marriage counseling and we are uh, counseling couples who are going to get married, the women have a hard time. They say, well, I will submit as long as he's following Jesus. I will submit as long as he's walking worthy of that submission. And, and I don't want to get too far off track because this isn't really the message that we're going with today. But God told you to submit as unto the Lord, right? In all things. And so, yes, us men, we need to walk worthy of that in our lives, in our marriages, in our relationships. Uh, but for you women, know this, that that was God's charge to you. It wasn't God's charge to the man to tell you. Men know that too. God didn't tell you to go home and tell your wife that he said to submit to you, right? We, all, we often say, Amanda, what are you doing? God put me in charge over you. God told you to submit under me. God didn't tell me to tell my wife that. God told, told my wife that. Right? That scripture is for her. Scripture for me is to love my wife as Christ loved the church. That means to give myself for her that I can present a blameless and spotless bride at the time of Christ. Amen? So these, these things that we talk about, sometimes you know, we want to, we want to put... Um, strings on them. There's always strings attached. Well, if this, then I'll, then I'll do that. Well, that isn't what God said. Do what God called you to do, period, and leave the results up to Him. We hear these verses regularly, regularly, but today I want to give you a biblical account to where we can actually see the importance. If I went through this body and I talked to, to each one of you men... <clears throat> By the way, the, the title of this message is The Responsibility of a Man. So I just want to tell you guys that's the direction we're going. If I went through and asked all of you men, what is your first responsibility? Some would say, well, it's my wife. Well, it's my kids. Well, it's my job. Well, it's, it's to be a provider. It's to be this. It's to be that. I will tell you men, your first responsibility is Jesus Christ. That is your first responsibility. And in that, when you're subject to Him and you truly surrender all to Him, then He will give you all the pieces that you need, what you need to do and when you need to do it. We even look at the beginning of Genesis when God created the, the Garden of Eden and He put Adam in it. He didn't just put Adam in it only to enjoy it, but He did give him that permission. It was for his enjoyment, but it was also for him to tend to, as said, to dress it, to keep it, basically to till it, to take care of it. Amen? Turn to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start in 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them, he's talking about, he wasn't just talking about Adam right here, he's talking about mankind when he said, let us make man in our image, right? Because he said, let us, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God gave us dominion over those things from creation. I want to describe what a covering is to you before we move forward. How many of you guys have heard Pastor Tim? How many of you guys have, have heard him refer to a covering as a kasaw? Well, some of you guys, you guys don't pay attention because he says it like every Sunday. So. <laughs> All right. A kasaw, that's the Hebrew word for covering. It literally means a skin, a protection, something that will conceal, something that will cover what's underneath it. That skin isn't there just to be there. It's there to protect the thing that's underneath, the thing that's being covered or concealed, the thing that's being hidden. In Job 1, 6 through 10, uh, you don't have to change this. I'm going to go through it really quick. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Like he didn't already know. Where'd you come from? Where were you just at? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. The Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? 
Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Has not thou made a hedge? I want you guys to remember this, this, this hedge. Has thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. That's the type of covering that we need to be for the marriage that we're in. That's the type of protection, the type of kasa, the hedge, the fence. That's the thing that needs to guard the ones that we love. Amen? The, the prayer and the, the fasting and the word of God and the obedience and, and all of those things that God has called us to do. That's the hedge that needs to be around the ones underneath you. If you are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you are born again, then I would guarantee that you have some type of influence and responsibility. Amen. Whether it's a wife, a wife and kids, employees, people in ministry underneath you. I'm sure every man in here has some type of ministry, some type of responsibility. As a man of integrity and a man of character, the things that we need to have are spiritual things, not worldly things, right? So we have a, a spiritual covering over our family, a spiritual protection. That kasa is a spiritual thing that protects our family, our wife, and our kids from the lies and the attacks of the enemy. Turn back to Genesis, starting in 2.7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and this is the one that, that is the clencher here, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. I'm going to skip about three verses, or I need to get a new King James up here. <laughs> we're going to jump down to 15. Earlier when I was reading this, my eyes were moving so fast and my mouth couldn't keep up and I got tongue twisted about five times, so I'm just going to skip over. That's called wisdom. Okay? <laughs> Verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. It literally means to till it, to make sure that it had everything that it needed to, to have. He was the one who was basically the gardener of the Garden of Eden. He was the one who, who knew what each of those things needed, to till it, to keep it, to make sure that it was doing the things that God would have it do. 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam, whatsoever Adam called the, the living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowl, to every beast. But for Adam, there was no help me for him. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. Verse 23 says, and, God, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's another thing that in our culture we sure have a hard time with. Upon your marriage, you were called to leave the covering, leave the authority of your parents, and to cleave to your spouse. We don't teach that today, do we? We're still 35, 40 years old, and you know, whatever mom and dad say, go. Not to, to say that we're not called to honor them and respect them, but we're called to leave that authority and to cleave to our spouse. 
Now they're flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone. Verse 25, it says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. In chapter 3, starting off, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle. The serpent was more subtle than any other creature, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Who did the serpent go to? He went to Eve. Why do you think he went to the woman? Why do you think he went to Eve? He was more subtle. He, he knew what to do to get in. And I will tell you today in your marriage, with your children, in your ministry, the enemy knows what to do to get in. And it's up to you to either stay in a spiritual spot to not let him, or if you open doors, he will come in and you'll be cleaning up a disaster. You'll be attempting to. I promise you, men, it's easier to hold your post. It's easier to hold your position, even though sometimes you feel like you're fighting with blood, sweat, and tears. It's, it's easier to hold that post and be a living sacrifice and just get to the other side of it than to compromise and open up a vulnerability for the enemy to come in. Amen? The enemy is out there to steal, kill, and destroy. He's out there like a roaring lion. When he presented himself to, to God, what did he say? I've out, been out there on the earth walking to and fro, basically looking to find somebody who is weak and vulnerable, finding somebody who he could devour. That's his intent for you, for your family. And however he has to get in, if he has to back door and go to your spouse or to your kids or to, to somebody in the ministry where there's an open door, the enemy knows how to get in. It's up to us, men, to be a good covering. So he said unto the woman, he said unto Eve, Yea, have God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. You know what's really cool about that? And she wasn't even created yet when that was told to Adam. So Adam told her. Adam told her. But where was Adam at right now? Was he standing there with Eve and afraid to speak up? Was he standing in the background just listening to this conversation and, and didn't really know how to handle it? Or was Adam off doing something else? We, we don't know. You can't tell for sure by Scripture. But either way, I will tell you this. Adam left his post. Period. Whether he stood back and didn't intervene, or whether he was gone doing something else, tilling the garden or whatever, he left Eve vulnerable in either circumstance. But she knew. She knew what God had said. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He made Eve feel like God lied to her. Like she couldn't trust what God said. That isn't the reason. You won't surely die. God told you you'll die, but he only said that because he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to have the same knowledge that he does. He doesn't want you to be as wise as he is. As he is. So God lied to you. Do you think if it would have been Adam, it would have been different? Absolutely. That's why he didn't go to Adam. The enemy knew it would have been different too. Therefore, he went to Eve. He deceived her. It says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to her eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, what did she do? She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he, and he did eat it. She bought into the lie. She was vulnerable. The serpent beguiled her. He absolutely duped her. And she took it. Adam left his post. And now not only do they pay for it, but we pay for it. 
You know how many times people say, well, my drug addiction only affects me. I'm not hurting anybody. My alcoholism, my choices, my, my destructive life only affects me. No, it doesn't. It affects everybody around you. It affects your community, right? It affects your family. It affects you. It affects your friends. It affects everybody around you. Nobody's sin only ever affects them. Her sin still affects us today, right? Still affects us today. Verse 7, it says, And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. In verse 25 of the last chapter, it says they, did, they weren't even ashamed. They were naked, and it didn't even bother them. They weren't even ashamed. But now, they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They covered their nakedness because they were ashamed. Right before verse 6, I said a minute ago that you, we don't really know if Adam was there or not because it says, and when, when Eve saw that the, the tree was good, we don't know if there was a, a lapse in time there because Adam was there before and we see that he's there when she actually eats it. And, and you can't really tell if there was a time lapse right there. So we don't know if Adam was actually physically present at the time that the enemy was speaking to her, that the serpent was speaking to her. She was seduced. She bought into the lie. Adam left her vulnerable and the enemy had his way with her. As men, we need to make a conscious decision to put the first thing first, and that's Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that our wives and our children are protected from the enemy. When we do not hold our post, we leave an open invitation for the enemy to come in. According to the, the world standard, I can be a good father, yet a bad covering for my children. Listen to this. I can be a good husband, I can be a good father, but a bad covering, according to the world. But what I cannot do is be a good covering and a bad father. I cannot be a good covering and be a bad husband. I have a wife and four kids. Well, with Ezekiel, it seems like we have ten kids. <laughs> but I have a wife and four kids. And unless God miraculously did something and I was able to clone myself, there's no way for the rest of my life and for their lives that I can be physically present with my wife and all four kids at the same time. Right? There's no way. What I can do in my physical absence is I can protect them all spiritually. I can be a good covering. Right? Because that, that protection isn't my physical body and my physical presence in their life. That covering is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? The Spirit of God. It is something that will, will be uncompromised. Right? If there's a good covering over them, it will be uncompromised. The enemy cannot get into that. Amen? I said earlier, it's not our job to hover. It's our job to cover. Amen? Because we can try to physically round up our kids and we can try to, try to be the, that hen, right, with her chicklings. But they're going to grow up. And they're going to be physically absent from our lives at times. But we need to be in a position where we can spiritually make sure that they are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? In Isaiah 59, 1, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. You know, we can pray here for people on the other side of the globe, and God can touch them. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we think, man, i got to be right there. i got to have eyes on them. i got to be protecting them. Well, you're not always going to be able to do that. So you need to be in a place with Jesus Christ in a good place with Jesus, where your kids can be covered, your kids will be protected, your wife will be covered, your wife will be protected, your ministry will be covered, your ministry will be protected. Amen? Your business, wherever you're at, whether you're the legislature for the District 2 down in, in Boise representing uh, this district, whether you own a business down the road and you have four employees, whether you're one of the employees and you're working for a business, you need to be able to protect everything around you, everything in your life in a spiritual matter. Amen? Amen? Sometimes it's easy in our humanness to really look at all of the physical stuff because it's easy to see. But when we bow down and say, you know what? I give it all to Him. Then He gives you these spiritual eyes. 
And he gives you the spiritual ability to be able to pray for the ones at the times they need prayer. Praise God. When we put the most important thing first, our relationship with Jesus Christ, the rest will be automatic. When we commit our heart, mind, body, soul, and strength to God, He will be the one who will be able to use us to influence the ones around us. The responsibility of a man is not his family. It's Jesus Christ. Amen? There was a reason that God didn't create man and woman at the same time, both out of the dust of the ground. At the end of the day, just like in my marriage, just like in leadership at a church or, or in business, there always needs to be a responsible party. And I believe that God created us separate at a different time because not only are we completely different creations, but there needed to be a headship. God, as we spoke at the beginning, is the head over Christ. Christ is the head over man. Man is the head over woman. And when we're able to, to walk in that and to believe that in a spiritual sense, then I believe things will change in our lives. I believe, men, it's time to put our own ideas, our own agendas, our own thoughts and feelings aside and surrender our lives to Jesus Christ so the things that are, are in us and through us can be influenced by Him and not by us. I want to ask you men and you women, obviously, we're going to get ready and close, but I would ask you before we, we go into anything else, if there's anybody in here and you know that God is knocking at the door and He's trying to get your attention and you have yet to open up that door and invite Jesus Christ into your life to be your Lord and Savior, I would ask you as we, we get ready to close, I would ask you guys to come up if you're ready to say, you know what, I want to say yes to Jesus today. I would ask you to come up and put your head at the altar pastor's going to play something. I would ask you if God is knocking, tugging at your heart, and you're just ready to say, you know what, I'm sick of me. I want Christ in my life. Come up now. Feel free to come up to the altars. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can I get some of you leaders, some of you guys that are that are able to pray with these men. Can I please get you men with these guys? I don't want them up here alone. Now I want to ask all of you men in this house and even some of you women because they're single moms and there's moms who are raising kids. I'm going to ask you if you felt like you have not been the covering over the ones that you're called to cover. If you have failed and you have fallen short and you've left open doors for the enemy, I would ask you to come up and lay your face at this altar and pray and ask God to close those doors that your heart would become absolutely serious for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Feel free to come up and we'll pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. If there's some other men in here who can pray with these guys. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Chet. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to remind all of you that, that sometimes we think it's about actually standing up and making that, making that path, but it isn't. It's about your heart. It's about your heart working out your salvation with fear and trembling, your heart crying out to Jesus in this time of need. And I would ask you, be sincere and make it real. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus for all of these men and women who've come up to the altar, Lord God. The ones who say, I want to say yes to Jesus today, God, I pray that you would grant them repentance and that they would be born again. That they wouldn't just have this acknowledgement of who you are, but they would have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And for the ones who feel like they've left doors open, that they've compromised, that they have not been serious about their relationship and the covering they're called to be, God, I pray that you grant them the ability to see where they've left the vulnerabilities. The doors open. The doors crack. I pray there would be repentance in this house today, God. Real godly sorrow for all of our shortcomings, all of our sin. God, I pray that you would redeem us from our sin today in this house. That you would be lifted up in the name of Jesus and all men would be drawn to you. We glorify you, Lord. We love you so much. Thank you for saving a wretch like me. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church. Thank you, Lord.